So Dina will come back. I suggest that we'll begin meanwhile. Okay? I think so, no? Isado? So I have questions. <laughs> so I have questions. First of all, to a, a question to Shlomi. So I, I wanted to ask you about, um, of course you couldn't find, I think, uh, information about that, but about the motivation of people who joined the demonstration. Because you mentioned the 27 uh, Sephardic uh, Jews. Well, I'm not sure that all of them came to the demonstration to demonstrate against the reparations. I know, but maybe some of them came to demonstrate against what we call Shilton Mapai, against Mapai, and not, and it was part of the demonstration against Mapai, and they uh, joined it. So this is a, this is a suggestion. Um, <clears throat> I went to uh, to to Ron. About, you spoke about uh, Nehemiah Robinson. I think it's so important to mention Nehemiah Robinson and also to mention, to speak about the Robinson brothers whose service to the Jewish people is so important. Not so many people know about it, but it's so important for so many. Dina, uh, Nithalti, sorry. You said that? For so many. Okay. <laughs> for so many years. Um, and I just wanted to mention two things. First of all, that uh, Nehemia, this is a study that I'm doing now, Nehemia Robinson, uh, at the, the end, towards the end of the 50s, the beginning of the 60s, he took a leading role uh, in uh, the effort to bring Nazi criminals to justice. So this is a continual work of the Institute of Jewish, uh, of the Institute of Jewish Affairs. So this was one point. The second point is, the one that mentioned by Dina, which is the Nuremberg trial, and the, um, the role of the Institute of Jewish and the role of the Institute of Jewish Affairs, and the role of uh, Jacob Robinson was so important towards the uh, towards the trial. I think that, uh, in my opinion, um, uh, Jack, uh, Robinson had a tremendous impact on Jackson, which you can see. Um, I don't agree that, uh, about the, the concept about the Holocaust in the Nuremberg trial, but I won't go in it. But if you can see, if you read the um, speech of Jackson at the beginning of the trial, you can see the influence of uh, Jacob Robinson on him. And about the, ma the, the British mandate, um, <clears throat> and about the Nuremberg trial, and the um, and negotiation with Jacob Robinson about bringing Hein Weizmann to the Nuremberg trial when they did everything that Chaim Weitzmann will not come mm -hmm. uh, um, to the trial. Um, my last uh, comment is to Professor Reuveni, um, <coughs> uh, is about the, this sentence that I mentioned this morning, or this phrase, im Namen des Deutschen Volkes, in the name of the uh, German people, which I'm not sure that you emphasized it enough, but what I wanted to say, it, this was really a distortion, a historical distortion to say, to make this distinction between Nazis and Germans. Now, the Israeli government didn't respond to it. I mean, if you see, first of all, a, a, a Ben Gurion in his diary, a, a, when he saw the draft, he wrote, a, Adenauer is not going to speak about responsibility. This is what Ben Gurion said, he realized. He's not going to speak about the responsibility of the German people. And the, the fact that they, the, I was amazed that the Israel, Israelis did not, in the press they did, but not the government. You can see the, the press release of the Israeli government. They said, it seems that the Germans took a, a responsibility, but they didn't really respond to this distortion. And this distortion became a distortion in all of Adenauer's speeches during the 50s and the beginning of the 60s, just to mention that prior to the Eichmann trial, he spoke in the Bundestag and he said, we the Germans in Germany suffered not less of the Jews in Europe. 
and all the, the atrocities were not made by the Germans, by but a group of uh, Nazis of the, what the uh, um, writing letter called the alibi of the German people. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, so now we have uh, some time for questions and answers. The answers, of course, uh, will come from our uh, from our lecturers, the participants in this uh, session. Um, whoever would like uh, to ask a question is invited uh, here so that it can be recorded. Okay, I see some hands up. You were first, please. רגע, הוא צריך לבוא הנה, לא? או? על השאלה. Okay. Uh, as far as I know, uh, East Germany didn't pay yet until now its share in the reparations agreement. Uh, and it was estimated or agreed upon as one third of the reparation agreement. And it is estimated uh, in nowadays terms at uh, $18 billion. Uh, I would like uh, uh, to hear uh, the panel what uh, uh, they know about it and any remarks. Thank you. Okay. Who of the panel would like to answer? Yeah? Ron, Bakasha. I'll make a comment on this that is completely unresearched, undocumented, not backed up by any official files. According to uh, information given to me in the early 1990s and repeated in various newspaper reports, uh, an agreement between Israel and the Federal Republic while East Germany was collapsing uh, was that Israel should not respond to East Germany's last minute attempts to gain credibility uh, that they, Israel should wait and West Germany would resolve whatever debts they had. Shortly after the uh, German unification um, and as a purported response to Israel's non-intervention in the first Iraq war, West Germany agreed to supply Israel with a number of submarines. Israel purchased one and I believe received two at the expense of the German taxpayer. Given that the submarines are the most expensive weapons platform, the hints that appeared in the press was that this was in fact West Germany's um, payment on behalf of the East German account. But I haven't seen that in documents. Okay. So you, you didn't get an answer. It is still to be fully researched. Iris, please state your name. <laughs> I'm Iris, and I have a question for Gideon. Um, Gideon, did the, the Jewish or Israeli side also demand an expression of sorrow, any apology from the Germans in the declaration, or was it only a declaration about guilt? Okay, Gideon, please. Maybe we should collect, then we'll have a... <laughs> <laughs> They, they expected a, a, a statement of, of apology, but I think the way they, they framed it was more around this kind of, they, they spoke more in this concept of guilt and responsibility. They thought that uh, you know, apology would be pushing it too far. And 
at the end of the day, they weren't really interested in apologies, they were interested in the money. Yeah, so, you know, it, it wasn't the kind of, and, and that's also kind of why, why I find it interesting in, in to kind of frame it in this kind of, in this kind of concept of reconciliation that eventually kind of led to that because nobody thought that that would be the end or the, 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 the kind of the aim of that. There was no kind of, of goal here. The goal was to get reparations. After that, everything was open. All what happened afterwards and still are, is happening is, was totally unintentional. Were they afraid of public oh, opinion? Well, again, I think that the key kind of relationship was between guilt and responsibility. And of course, the, you know, initially the, the Jewish side, it's like also the, the language I think here is very important because at the beginning, I think you said that, I mean, the, the Israelis looked for a term also to, to kind of describe what they are doing. Mm -hmm. And reparations immediately was kind of disqualified mainly because of the Americans. The Americans said, and I think a lot of people wrote about that. This is not a term, a legitimate term. And the Israelis was also very much acquainted. They knew, you know, the German discourse, and they knew that the term guilt will not work. So responsibility was more of what they looked for in terms of also their, you know, their attempts to understand what is actually the German means with the term Wiedergutmachung, Yeah, but it was, again, you have to go, you have to work with what you have. I mean, in the name of the German people, it says also, however, yeah? It says actually, you know, the Germans were, you know, these, a lot of awful things happened, but eventually in the name of the German people, bad things happen. But, you know, I th again, you ha I think we need to read that from the perspective of the contemporaries. This was regarded, I think somebody said that in the, mo in the morning, as a kind of a huge moral, I think you said that, a kind of a you know, victory. And you have also evidence from other Europeans that the, the Israel, I mean, that's also how Israel presented it. We managed to, to kind of, uh, you know, take Germany and basically, you know, they admitted that they did something and nobody else kind of uh, achieved that. So again, I think we, need to avoid reading this in our eyes and start reading that in the eyes of the contemporaries. And again, what Konstantin Goslav said in the morning, the, there's also another context here, that the context of the Arab-Israeli conflict, there's the context of the Palestinian uh, refugees, and this was in the head of the people all the time. They're gonna acknowledge that, we have to acknowledge something else. This is what was in the heads of these people. For us, it's something very, you know, kind of, distance and surprising even, but this was in their heads. Well, this is the, the, the basis of writing history, to put yourself in the shoes of the people then and to understand the, the atmosphere and the ambience that, that was then at the time. And they were also afraid of the public opinion, to, to have a declaration that the public in Germany was not ready yet to, to accept. Please, sir, please state your name and who you are referring to. Uh, my name is uh, Michael, uh, Michael Borchert. Um, I would just like to make a short remark to what you discussed before. I mean, we should never uh, underestimate the level of opposition against any reparations uh, in Germany, in the German public. I mean, only 11% supported the, uh, the uh, agreement and the reparation talks, but that isn't my question. I know it's a rather bad academic habit to say what you didn't find uh, in a speech. Uh, my question <laughs> goes to Jakob uh, Tovi, and I fall in that trap in a way, uh, because I would uh, like uh, you to elaborate a little bit more on the religious dimensions that have been put in all three arenas you have been pointing out. I mean, in the journalistic arena, in the public arena, uh, but uh, especially in the Knesset, we had the very religious uh, kind of argumentation and I think, uh, and I would be interested in your, uh, um, uh, in your views, I think first, uh, of course, the opponents of the reparations, they started uh, with these religious motives and then forced the other 
to kind of also react with religious uh, motives to say it's a mitzvah to ask for reparations. So if you could elaborate on that a little bit more, because I think it would help us to understand uh, the whole uh, situation. But it's also a mitzvah to hunt down Amalek and Midian. Yeah, yeah, both. I mean, Amal Amalekites, Midianites, and all the other ites. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know. But but uh, I find it interesting that there was also a, a religious answer to that on the side of Ben Gurion. Well, uh, one of the archive that I uh, searched into was the religious archive of the National Religious Party in uh, Ramat Gan, I think, I don't, in Barilan University, Bar yes. Mm -hmm. Now, when you talk about the religious uh, parties in Israel, you are talking about four parties. Two parties belong to the ultra-Orthodox, and uh, two parties uh, refer to the religious, Zionist religious parties. And when I searched the, this archive as part of uh, something like 20 archives that I searched for my English version of the book on reparations, this uh, archive, the religious archive, contained nothing, nothing with regard to reparations. It appears that the religious uh, members of the Knesset, the ultra-Orthodox members of the Knesset, uh, didn't give the, the same attention to this issue as the secular members of the Knesset. Uh, there, were, there were division between uh, these parties, between uh, those people who object uh, the issue of uh, negotiations, but uh, approximately most of the Zionist religious members of the Knesset support the idea of negotiations, while most of the ultra-Orthodox members object. Uh, but due to a coalition uh, um, order or uh, the coalition uh, duty of these uh, parties that were uh, part of the coalition uh, of Ben Gurion coalition, they didn't uh, vote against, apart from one member, Mordechai Nuruk, who was a survivor. Mm -hmm. So uh, to sum it up, most of the Zionist religious didn't object this uh, issue, most of the ultra-Orthodox object, and none of them uh, fight uh, in favor or, neg or uh, uh, against this issue. Okay. Ah, Bakasha. Sure, please. So, thank you very much for all these wonderful presentations. I, I have two questions. The first one is a very factual one, and it goes to Gideon. So, uh, in my vague recollections, the United States was also contributing to the. Uh, uh, to the Adenauer Declaration. So wasn't, weren't they participating? I think uh, Benjamin Buttenweiser, who was also mentioned in Ron Spike's uh, presentation, uh, uh, was one of the editors of the document, or maybe I'm wrong, so this is just a factual question. And a more complex question goes to uh, Shlomi Shetrit. So uh, police and police power also has a symbolic dimension and uh, it's also about communicating security and when I, I was seeing these pictures uh, I was wondering about the uniforms so it's always a message and uh, so I, I, if I so in my visual archive in my personal visual archive two associations popped up so the one was British Army and the other one was the ghetto police uh, which might have to do with my uh, personal visual archive. But the question is, how did they want to look like? Did they invent something totally new, a new visual message? Uh, how didn't they want to look like? And uh, the second question, um, where, where did they get their strategy how to react to such a demonstration? Because uh, they uh, did not have uh, such an experience. It's always a question, how do you behave? Because you don't want to get in a certain role. Yeah, uh, I, I think that there must uh, uh, have been some real, uh, traditions from which they drew their strategic considerations. So, 
this is a little bit more complex question. Thank you. So I think I, I mentioned that. So as much as I know, the Americans, um, McCloy and uh, Button Visa, were involved in the first drafts that before were given to the Jewish readers, they were involved in that. I must admit that, again, uh, hopefully somebody can help me here, but I didn't find a lot of sources in the German uh, archives about all these procedure and the American archive. All what I found is all kinds of references of all kinds of people kind of reflecting on, on the memoirs about what happened. But they were involved, and the Israelis at some point, when Israelis saw the kind of the second draft, immediately what they did, like they still do today, run to the State Department and say, look, you know, at this text, it, it won't work. And they try to involve the American to pressure the, the Germans about that. And just a small remark, because uh, you said about the 11%, and I know these uh, surveys, but this 11% refers to or operations to, uh, to Jews. But if you look at the whole survey, most of the Germans were actually for reparations, not necessarily for Jews, but for others, how, what they saw as victims of National Socialism. So, again, you have to contextualize that. Yeah. And uh, again, I mean, Iris' work really shows how the Jewish kind of claims piggyback the other claims. Yeah. Uh, okay, now for uh, Shlomi to answer, I just uh, would like to answer what is my intuitive answer to you. Of course, it's a new police, it's a new country, it's a new Jew, it's a new everything. And Israel was three years old when they say there, has, there haven't been such demonstrations ever since, what ever since, three years. So it's all new, definitely. Well, the short answer is that whenever there's anything that you think is wrong with Israel and you don't know why is that, blame the British. And uh, I, I want, yeah, today they have the series, uh, the mandate, which finally shows that. But uh, by the way, I, my, my previous role, I was uh, responsible for the police museum, which you are more than invited to come. And I had a delegation from the Metropolitan Police uh, in London. And I began by asking them if they knew that everything wrong in Israel was their fault. Yeah, they also laughed, and uh, a few months later I had the delegation from the Federal Police Academy uh, from Germany, and I also told them that uh, the British uh, visited me, and I asked them if they knew that everything was wrong was their fault. The, they also, the Germans also laughed, and I said, don't laugh yet, we will get to your part. <laughs> now, re regarding, I'm, I'm opening uh, our website, we have a, here it is. Uh, we have a database, and I want to show you the guide for riot control published in July 1949, which was translated from English. It still uh, cites the um, High Commissioner as the legal authority. And the Israel police which was established on May 14, 1948, was actually a direct continuation of the mandate Palestine police force. Now, they knew that they had to differentiate themselves from their predecessor because the Palestine police force was the main enemy of the Yishuv, so much that in the um, uh, children novels, Hasamba, which was a very, a very popular uh, series of novels, uh, which uh, deals with the later part of the mandate at the beginning, the villain is Sergeant Smith from the police. They are the bad guys. And they knew that they have to change everything, including the uniforms. However, uh, on May 15, there was a small thing uh, that began in Israel also, which is called the War of Independence, and which uh, made uh, the police very low priority. So they kept whatever they had, meaning they used the British uh, uniforms, uh, British gear, and actually the law which governs police authority in Israel today is the Palestine Police Force Ordinance from 1926. 
So even today, we are still uh, continuing uh, the British mandate. However, the, there is one uh, important change with the tried to instill, and here we see here are the order how to use it, and, and it actually says how you have to uh, hit someone uh, on his uh, uh, cheek or on his head or in the belly, etc. But the most interesting thing is the way that they you know, how to use uh, gas, etc. But here, in the end, there it is. And this is very important, and this was probably not translated from the English. Uh, you have to, con to consider very well the use of force when dispersing uh, riots, but if you need, you will use it when anything else uh, isn't enough, water. Uh, and here, minimal force that will prevent the, uh, public disorder. This is British, and here, remember you are not governing the crowd, you are guiding it. So the police was seen as an enemy, historically as an enemy. Uh, they dressed like the enemy, but not because they wanted to dress like that, they didn't have any choice, and they used uh, the methods which the previous enemy of the issue used. Please don't go away, there is a short question for you. Uh, it's and not that so much a, the, that would be the last one. It, this is a footnote oh. for your research. Um, you are probably aware that uh, Dov Shilansky was he arrested. Was arrested yeah. He was arrested for placing a bomb uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to protest the reparations. Shilansky was later on Speaker of the Knesset, and he was a leading advocate of the death penalty for terrorists. But he had been arrested, I believe, jailed for four months for terrorism in Israel. So when I asked him, how do you square this with your political position, he said, well, it was a small bomb and it didn't go off. <laughs> uh, now, Shilansky was also arrested uh, on January 7th in the riots. So was uh, Miriam Tassa, later Miriam Tassa Glaser, and her brother. And so was uh, Miriam Rivlin, the mother of Reuven Ruby Rivlin. <laughs> yeah, Chaim Korfu was also, yeah. But there was an all-star. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, before ending, uh, uh, Dr. Toby was speaking about, uh, there was a question about the religion, uh, religion and the uh, religious opinions in the Knesset, and he uh, mentioned four parties. So I just wanted to end by saying that in 1944, there were here elections for the General Assembly, the General Assembly of the Yishuv, 1944. There were at that time 450,000 Jews here. How many parties do you think presented themselves for the elections? 400,000? 450,000 people for the General Assembly, 54. We'll end here. Thank you very much. It was a fascinating day, a fascinating panel. Thank you, everyone.